Well, um, the book that I want to tell you about is called Across the Chicken Neck, um, Travels in the Northeast. But I think before I talk about the book, I have to little give you a little background of it. it uh, it's a travel book. It's about a journey my husband and I took. It's about 15,000 kilometers through the Northeast. We drove from Delhi to Burma border, Bhutan. But I want to begin in the beginning. That is why we took this journey. I had already been working in the Northeast as a human rights lawyer, taking up cases on behalf of the people and some of the uh, leaders of the armed resistance. And I had been taking up their cases both uh, within the country in Indian courts and abroad and with the UN uh, High Commission for Refugees. So I've had all this experience as a lawyer, human rights lawyer. But the question that I raised to myself at the end of this 30 years was that, uh, you know, why was I defending all these people who are looked upon as anti-national? And I look upon myself as an uh, Indian nationalist. My nationalism is not the same as defined by government official nationalism. So it seemed to me that I needed an answer that how we travel through Northeast, where so many people are demanding different nations, nation states, nations, and we share a common citizenship. It was time to me to look at the broader perspective instead of taking up specific cases of uh, people or leaders. So this journey is really about that. And it was a four-month journey um, through uh, Nepal. We went through Nepal to Arunachal, Assam, Nagaland, Manipur, and then the other side of Arunachal, touching all the borders. Because Chicken Neck, I should explain, is a 21-kilometer strip at Siliguri, which joins the northeast, seven states of northeast, with the mainland India. So if you cut off the 21, then the northeast region is cut off, except for Sikkim, which doesn't come uh, within that. It is outside the Chicken Neck, in a sense. So this was a whole journey. And basically, I think what I discovered was that as I went along, it was very, very depressing, actually, because it is, uh, you know, if you see coffee table books of, on Northeast, you feel people dancing and singing in these very colorful costumes. There was obviously there was no such thing, except when we landed in Nagaland in the middle of Hornbill Festival. There is no dancing and singing. And in my, when I was a student in uh, JNU, Jawaharlal Nehru University, there I remember the Naga students when I first got to know them. There was always a guitar. There was always singing. There was always some joke, even in the most difficult of times. But even that music had died down. Even those smiles had got really very diluted. So this journey, this this, it's just a travel log. It's a political travel log. And the book really describes 15 insurgencies or maybe 16 insurgencies, but not the armed, uh, the fighting, but their histories. Why do these people take up arms? Why do they fight, uh, you know, for some history or for a border or for their nationality? And so often these fights and the reasons for these fights are dismissed by newspapers. If you read newspapers, you say two people killed, four people killed, five people killed, one bomb blast. You don't see why Boros would take up arms. Why would Rabhas take up arms? Why would Garos take up arms? Why would Nagas take up arms? Why would these people leave the comfort of their homes and stay in jungles? So these are the histories of these people as we travel. And these histories and their present struggles, they link the two up. So that's really what this book is about. Yes, actually there are many, many aspects. There are tribes against... But when you ask this question, it just reflects the kind of thinking we have. All these tribes fighting against each other. But they weren't always fighting. What was it that made them suddenly hostile to each other? For instance, as you mentioned, Boros. Who were the Boros? Who are these people historically? What do they feel? What is their history? I am not saying that we must agree or disagree with one side or the other. But I am saying that we must understand. As citizens of a country, we must understand each other. Without this understanding, there can be no solution. So I have shown how the Boros themselves, their own history, this is very ancient people, the, the most ancient in the Northeast. 
and their language for instance they have their own names for the brahmaputra they have their own names for uh, for everything i mean for the grass for the trees for the rivers for people for uh, their own histories all this was wiped out because what really happened in the northeast was and this is what came through through my uh, travels actually and i think it came through after writing i understood it is the 11th 12th century brahmans went from varanasi and they spread out all over northeast and invented stories to link the the each tribe with you know the indian main mainstream so they invented a story that the manipur raja came from uh, the you know descendants of arjun and chitrangada they invented that parushram went to arunachal they invented that uh, uh, rukmani krishna's consort was actually a mishmi tribe so in this way so there was this huge uh, brahmanization or hinduization and an imposition of caste but all these people who even joined or agreed to be part of this hindu society found themselves at the bottom rungs they found themselves a scheduled caste for instance rajbanshi's coach which is the most serious insurgency in the north it uh, covers bengal and uh, uh, bengal and assam now there these rajbanshis are from gayatri devi's clan she's from rajbanshi but today in bengal they are scheduled caste so today they are rejecting that hindu and brahman uh, legacy and history and going back to their tribal roots similarly boros for instance uh, they are called in the literature by shankar dev uh, the great saint in assam as a malej now this word in my generation and my parents generation was used ke are wo malej hai that is someone very low that is the word which is used for boros and today the mech tribe which still exists is a scheduled caste tribe untouchable they were so boro struggle for recovery of their history the pre hindu history and recovery of their past is a very very important aspect for them to survive and to get their self respect and dignity now with the modern processes and economies opening up and you have the migrant workers and the muslims coming in the bangladeshi muslims there seems to be a clash today between the boros and the bangladeshis but in the past and even right now when the first clashes began in kukrajar in the heartland of boro the person who was teaching boro language was an uh, was a bengali speaking muslim from bangladesh so this fact of course would never be brought out the people who a uh, lot of bangladesh uh, who are now bangladeshis who are from bengal in fact uh, contributed to khasi literature so one must remember that there are these histories of common um, uh, you know common cultures and uh, and uh, relationships which have been completely broken up because of these borders made by colonial uh, colonialism and continued after colonialism now the question is you say what do we do why are the boros killing the muslims that i will come to secondly let us first acknowledge what the boros are fighting for what the muslims are fighting for and then we will try and understand the depth of the problem just to give you an example for instance the big nelly massacre which was 5000 bengali uh, you know bangladesh origin muslims in assam it was the worst massacre in 83 february now everyone blame the tiwas for the for the massacre and tiwa is a tribe which is derogatory name is lalung now after 93 a japanese scholar went in and interviewed both the tiwas and these muslims who were the victims and she came up with this uh, findings in her research to say that neither of them were really responsible for the massacre and she blamed the assam movement now it's a long story and the book is published but let me just say this that when the findings were done a very eminent uh, assamese scholar sanjeev barua invited her to present her findings at his institute the government stopped that now the book has been published subsequently so it shows that if we recover the histories we will not be seeing this clash that we normally would have seen from 83 to 93 till uh, this japanese scholar came and recovered both the histories both sides and this so for me these histories are part of the right to dignity part of the right to life 
So actually my book basically goes from, you know, tracing these histories and linking it up with the present movements, pointing out uh, questions that I raised. And one of the things which really did move me was that uh, one of the reviews by someone, a young scholar from Assam said, what he liked about the book is the questions that I raised. I'm not trying to answer. I cannot answer. These are very complicated questions. I may have some parameters, but there's no way I can answer. But I think the book raises the questions, deepens an understanding. And you do go through this uh, book, I think, with a, you will feel much sadder, but I think perhaps a little wiser. You know, conflict has been there. The nature of the conflict is different. So, for instance, when the Ahoms came for, uh, at um, uh, 13th century, uh, the first people they came through were the Anaga villages. And that is in the Burunjis. And the, when the first Sukhupa arrives, he is uh, confronted with Nagas. He cannot cross. He has to go back to Patkai. Then he comes again. And when he comes to this village, he really massacres the Nagas. And he takes the son of the chief. He kills him and makes the man eat his liver. Now, this is a, a continuous memory in, the, in this village. And ten, uh, you know, many centuries later, they take the revenge and attack the Ahoms. And these memories are there. But the relationship of Nagas to the Ahoms was much more equal. It was two people fighting. They were equally matched. They fought some one, once Nagas won, another time Assamese won. So then, and, to, and the, uh, the Ahoms in the earlier stage, before they became Hinduized, they would wear the same kind of clothes, they would sit together and they could marry Nagas, they would uh, eat together. There was no caste system. Today, one of the reasons the nature of the conflict changed is because the caste system came in. Then there was this uh, higher, lower caste, then pollution, purity came in, not eating with people, feeling superior. So one fa factor was the caste and the conversion to Hinduism. Second is a conversion to Christianity in the, in the context of colonialism. So the conflicts have been there, but we must see the nature of conflicts change. And with the nature of conflicts changing, the nature of the, uh, the perceived differences changed. So that is what also we need to understand that this is when we say all violence is wrong, all conflicts are there, all migration, we cannot conflate these things. We have to see them in its historical particular context. You know, many other factors as I went along, there are, there are many other issues, cultural issues, the, the, the death of so many, like 400 cultures, people are struggling for languages. And uh, if you see Lepcha language died, the Mete uh, language died, Khasi language was on the endangered list of UNESCO languages. People really worked very hard to revive these languages. Now, Khasi is taught up to MA level. Khasi is no longer endangered language. Lepchas have for, had night schools and night schools all over and to revive their language. And they have beautiful websites and about their culture, revived and recovered their culture. And the same thing happened with Mete. And now it is in the eighth schedule. And the Boro language again is in the eighth schedule. So these people have been fighting from 19, Boros fought from 1959 for their language. So it is also a struggle of people to keep alive their language, their culture. So cultural rights of collective, you know, collective rights of people is another area which I think uh, it is through this writing of this book, I realized that how people are really fighting for uh, cultural survival. It's really life and death because your language dies, your culture dies, your values dies, the folk tales die. And that fight also is something which is against uh, the new uh, colonialism or this new liberalism and the new economic policy or what we call globalization or integration of markets. So in the towards the end of the book, um, again, I look at this Northeast, which I have known. And now, for instance, Highway 39, I think uh, one of my uh, friends also wrote a book called Highway 39. A chapter in my book also says Highway 39. Now, that's no longer National Highway 39. It's called Asian Highway 1. So these highways are going from Amsterdam to Vietnam. There's a trans-Asian railway which is coming right from Amsterdam to Vietnam. So we are going to see a complete change of this whole area. It's going to be linked. The markets are going to be linked, part of India's Lukis policy. 
So I think my book captures a moment of history which perhaps will all be gone in another few years and then we will read this and say, oh, this is what it was all about. So it is, it is a moment when the Northeast face is going to change, maybe for the better, but I'm not quite sure. <laughs>